I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're about to hear a chapter of an ongoing fantasy narrative, one I've written to be heard, not read. My voice, it's the only sound you'll hear, and it's all done in one single flawless take. Scald is serialized, so we pick up right where we left off last time. If this is your first episode, you might feel a little lost at the beginning, but I think you can handle it. And if not, the previous episodes are right there waiting for you. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 8. The beast's roar echoed through the forest, and the ferris knees shook as wildly as the leaves on the ancient gnarled trees that lined the clearing. For the first time in generations, the metal of the Farron Confederacy was truly tested. Bravery amongst a score of archers, bows drawn and ready. That's hardly bravery at all. But bravery in the face of an unbeatable, unknown terror. Bravery whilst staring down those snapping jaws as your fellows scramble, possibly to put their hands on a weapon, but more likely to save their own craven skin. That is the essence of courage. The ravenous beast glanced around the clearing hastily, paralyzed by choice. Bury its face in the food still covering the simple wooden tables, or take a moment to hunt down more quickly moving prey. Such the terrified Ferris held in thrall, struggling to break the spell cast by the creature's hypnotic yellow eyes. The beast lowered itself to its haunches, preparing to pounce at the line of drunken archers that the guard Tavik had hastily assembled. Suddenly, the clearing filled with a new sound, the gruff, commanding tone of royalty, of a king, of the true king of men. King Maul. Halt. The beast whirled on the noise, turning its massive, fur-covered head to face the man, the weak sack of flesh and bones that would dare to hand out commands in its presence. Its eyes landed upon Maul and narrowed instantaneously before the beast leapt, taking to the air, arcing through the clearing over the heads of the panic-stricken Ferris. It landed in front of the long, ceremonial table, the one that played host to not only Maul, but the assembled leaders of the Farron Confederacy. The impact of its landing shook the ground, casting aside the table as well as those timorous leaders, those elected by virtue of their words not their deeds. But Maul was not one of those. He was made of sterner stuff than that, like an oak among saplings, a rock sticking up from the muddy water, the sole true mountain in a range of foothills. He stood there, waiting stern-faced for the beast he had dared to command. He reached out a powerful, steady hand, and he spoke. Skog. The hulking beast leaned against Maul, rubbing her massive head against his arm, purring loudly like the humongous feline that is fiercely independent but desperate for our attention on its terms, and its terms only. But though the savage king of men treated Skog like little more than a house pet, this was no ordinary cat. It was something ancient, older than even the elves, who prided themselves on being the first race to inhabit the world before the sundering. But though they were the first to build civilizations, Skog's kind was there long before, waiting and watching in the darkness. While the elves were busy searching for nuts and berries on the forest floor, Skog's kind ruled the wild primordial growth that covered the world, yellow eyes glowing in the darkness, omnipresent, taking what they will from the soft creatures that dared to carve out a living in their domain. And just as that primeval terror gave rise to generations of hereditary fears, night terrors that still haunted the slumber of elves, fair and high, young and old alike, Skog's race, the prime ancestor, that perfect expression of all that which is feline, gave rise to all cats across the sundered worlds. To the astonishment of the Ferris, now struggling to regain their composure in the wake of Skog's intrusion, Maul continued to caress the massive cat, which flopped down upon the earthen floor at his feet, exposing its belly in a sign of submission 
and trust. For these two were bound by something that transcended their species. They were bound by a sense of otherness that had rendered them both outsiders, unacceptable aberrations in the elf realm. That connection was what drew Maul to Skog in the dark, forbidden forest where he discovered and saved that orphaned cub. And it was what pulled Skog back to Maul when he was tied to the world tree, suspended in hateful captivity. The High Elves had meant to starve Maul to death, to give him an agonizing, painful end after what he had tried, what he had dared to attempt, punishing him less for the deed itself and more for the audacity that it betrayed. But Skog, owing Maul a debt of gratitude, would not allow him such a grim fate. Instead, Skog, of a race almost as old as the world tree itself, used those powerful claws to rend and tear the bark of that mighty ash, opening it up, allowing the tree's lifeblood, that viscous, glowing sap, to trickle down the branch and fall through the air, landing in Maul's waiting mouth. Over the course of that long, torturous decade, Skog grew from a cub to a lioness, noble, terrifying, and merciless except when it came to Maul, who never missed a single day of feeding, growing more bitter by the day, but also stronger, nourished by that enchanted sap. Now, it was Maul who nourished Skog, feeding the still-purring beast bits of meat from his bare hand. Of the assembled Ferris, the most revered members of that massive confederacy, Foran was the only one brave enough to step forward. We've brought you your beast. Her name is Skog, and you should treat her with the respect due to me, as we are bound more closely than one such as you can imagine. Yes, of course. Skog, I'm, I'm in awe of your connection with her. She, she struck down two of our archers. Two? Is that all? Why didn't you tell her you were bringing her to me? The cat raised her chin, demanding that Maul scratch her tender unguarded neck. And I thought that your kind prided itself on their wisdom. The two had been separated in the elf realm, when not even Skog, that ancient, powerful beast, could stand to be in the presence of him and his rictus grin. When Maul summoned him up, begging for his aid, Skog skulked off into the forest, leaving Maul to do his sinister deeds and walk that sinister path in cursed solitude. Now, however, they were reunited, never to be ripped asunder until they ran out of the very blood that had bound them. Maul crouched, smiling serenely as he petted Skog in long, gentle motions, his fingers digging deep into her thick fur to massage the skin beneath. I am satisfied, and I believe you bore witness to Skog sating her hunger. Where shall we sleep? Foran called to the human girl, who stood closer to Skog than many full-grown Ferris would even dare. Bathana, take King Maul and his companion to my personal refuge. I shall sleep elsewhere tonight. As Maul, Skog, and the fearless human girl Grathana strode through the clearing, the assembled Ferris observed with terrified, watchful eyes. Rest well, your majesty. Your strength shall be put to the test on the morrow. Maul laughed as he stooped down to relieve a still terrified Farron servant of his miraculously unbroken jug of wine. You think so little of me and Skog, who if not for my request would have devoured the best your little confederacy has to offer? Foran, unfazed, looked Maul dead on with those deep, luminous, knowing eyes. I think that you and Skog both are fearsome, deadly warriors. But what you will face is no mere warrior, no savage beast to be simply overcome or not. It is a force of nature, and it is to be reckoned with. Maul awoke the next morning, ravenous. Having failed to awaken for the midnight repast, slumbering straight through the night with the snoring Skog by his side, his first truly sound, unassisted, unencumbered sleep in ages. 
The most restful sleep comes not after accomplishing a task, for there's always yet another task to come. No, the soundest sleep springs forth from the knowledge that you shut your eyes in preparation of moving steadily toward a goal the following day. When Maul and Skog made their way to the clearing, they found a simple breakfast laid out, which the Ferris picked at while preparing for their excursion to the north. Warriors arming themselves with bows, spears, and swords. Shamans eager to get their hands on that potent horn. The tribal leaders observing silently and foreign, presiding over it all. While breaking his fast, Maul eyed the warriors suspiciously. Foreign. Why even bother bringing them? I thought I told you, my king. The beast is not just... It's a force of nature. I know. But I also know that if I fail... This monster turns its eyes to you and yours. You wouldn't dare dirty your hands with its destruction, as if you even could. So if your fighters won't fight, why bother bringing them? Do you even need help to retreat? Are you that weak and powerless? Foran forced a smile, suffering through Maul's insouciant insults as he nodded slightly at the warriors who had stopped their preparations, waiting anxiously upon further directions from their chieftain. And what about me, Maul? May I come on your hunt? Grathana had entered the clearing quietly and now stood next to Skog, allowing her to sniff, nuzzle, then gently lick her hand. The fearsome beast saw something familiar in the young girl and instinctively was driven to nurture it. Foreign cutting a wide berth around the massive cat he had watched murder two of his best archers, addressed Grathana gently. Sweet girl, this trip, it's, it's far too treacherous. Better for you to stay here and let her come. Let her come and see what a real warrior, a human warrior, a warrior king can do. Besides, when I'm gone, when she's of age, will you not lean upon her for similar errands, the ones that you'd prefer not to mar your delicate hands? Again, with little choice in the matter beyond what Maul allowed him to pretend to, Foran acquiesced. And Maul, the warrior king, gave the human girl a sly wink. The abbreviated party traveled north in the manner of the Farron people, climbing into a waiting tree, then coursing through the very veins of the earth itself, sliding through that warm green darkness full of whispers that sound like rustling trees and laughter like running water, following a path that twists and turns like the aimlessly wandering roots of the mighty oak they came sliding out of, many miles to the north of the arbor. Foreign had not exaggerated. It was bitter, Bitter cold when they emerged from the mossy warmth of that ancient oak. Snow covered the earth and a layer of ice covered the snow, making it possible for the nimble-footed elves to walk atop it while huddling underneath their cloaks and blankets, burying their hands in their armpits in a futile search for warmth. Maul, however, with his dense, powerful frame, stomped down through the ice and snow to the frozen ground underneath, kicking through the frost as if it were dry, crackling leaves. Maul's blood ran hot with impatient rage and ambition, warming him from the inside out so that even in this frozen landscape, he did not shiver, he did not shudder, he did not shake. Though he had spent the vast majority of his life in the temperate climes of the elf realm, where those cruel, indulgent, pale-skinned monsters lazed about in the sunlight, averse to true work, struggle, and accomplishment. Maul's race had come from elsewhere, emerging from dark, frigid caves that made this frozen forest feel balmy by comparison. Though he had never seen them himself, Maul still carried the memory of those caves and their raging cook fires. Laden with meat carved from frozen mammoths, it was a kernel of truth in his racial memory, and even now, it warmed him. Skog, with her heavy, luxurious fur, was as untroubled by the cold as Maul. She flopped down in a particularly deep snowbank, rolling in it, melting the snow and watching as it refroze instantaneously, covering her in icicles that would camouflage her thick, dark fur. 
as Maul chuckled at his companion, wallowing shamelessly in the snow, Foran approached, carrying a quiver of enchanted arrows and a long, curved bow of his own making. Even with your... Skog, I worry that you still underestimate the monster, my king. Please, take my bow. It has served me well throughout the years. And what would I do with this? Crack it and use it for kindling? You are no doubt fearsome in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but why risk it when you could assault the beast from a distance? Its speed would close the gap quickly, but at least you would have proven myself a coward, have shown that I feared my opponent as much as I did the grim realities of combat, that I'm too craven to embrace the horror of my own actions. No, keep your bow, foreign. I shall slay your monster in a manner befitting it and myself. They had used the trees to travel as close to the monster's domain as possible, but there were some wild, uninhibited places that even the Farron's arboreal causeway would not go. Thus, Maul and Skog were forced to continue their hunt on foot. The next time you see me, I'll be carrying that horn or impaled upon it. Maul and Skog trudged through that frozen forest for hours. The unblinking dual suns of that barrier realm crawled across the sky steadily, beating down on the snow and ice tirelessly, but with no visible effect upon that wintry blanket. Maul had sent Skog off by herself. She could travel quicker that way and even scale those tall, nearly limbless trees for vantage points, lookouts to scan the forest for this force of nature that so terrified Foran and his people. You see, Maul was no simple warrior to be frightened by superstitions and old wives' tales. This was the true king of men who had defied the high elves, befriended a beast as wild as he, freed himself from captivity, shattered a branch of the world tree and fashioned a weapon out of it, murdered the royal family, come through the roiling underneath unbroken, and fought his way out of anchor addiction. He had come this far with a wounded body, a shattered mind, and with the shackles of addiction clamped tightly onto his every limb. Now, healed, whole, and free, what could he possibly have to fear? It was with that confidence pulsating and growing in his mind that Maul first heard it. He was moving quickly, too quickly, more quickly than Maul had even anticipated, crashing through the brush with such speed and ferocity that the noise echoed throughout the forest, making it impossible to pinpoint. Maul couldn't tell from which direction it came, but he knew exactly where it was headed. Directly toward him. Another warrior, a wiser warrior, a lesser warrior, would have taken the cowardly route, hiding in ambush, perhaps knocking back the bow that Foran had offered him. But not Maul. If he couldn't beat this monster head on, he didn't deserve to beat it, to live or to take back the throne that was rightfully his. So Maul stood his ground, staring in the direction he judged the monster most likely to come from. He freed his cudgel from the fair and leather belt, just in time for the monster to strike him from the left, blindsiding him. Maul didn't have a chance to dive out of the way, to parry the attack, or even fully brace himself. When the monster came tearing out of the forest from an unanticipated direction, it was upon Maul before he even realized it. Its four legs galloping, its hot hooves sending plumes of steam up in the air every time they crashed down, making the monster appear as if it didn't run, but rather flew, hovering above the ground in a tumultuous cloud, the seeming source of the thunderous pounding as its four legs crashed down upon the ground repeatedly, like blasts of otherworldly lightning. The monster rose more than seven feet above the ground, towering over Maul, and it was likely this fact and this fact alone that saved Maul from that merciless goring, as the beast was unable to get its head down low enough, quick enough, to strike his prey with that long, single, twisting alabaster horn, erupting out of the center of the creature's long snout in bold defiance of logic, sense, and the natural order. Foran was right. This was no mere monster. It was a force of nature unto itself, and thus was excused from the physical boundaries that the rest of the natural world must obey. 
though Maul was spared a goring. In this pass, at least, he was not left unscathed. The massive, wall-like chest of the monster barreled into him, knocking him silly, such that he was unable to determine if the sparkles that filled his vision were falling off this magnificent creature, or just the after-effects of its mighty blow. Maul rolled with the attack, regaining his feet and brandishing his cudgel just in time to see the beast whirl around and rear back on its hind legs, letting out a whinnying cry that would be sure to send Skog running in its direction. Maul just had to bide his time survive until his companion arrived and they could overpower this otherworldly fiend, the last of its kind, raging in the dying light of its godlike race's tenure on a world unworthy of its presence. As the monster tore toward him once again, Maul suddenly saw something of himself in the beast, born too late to achieve the greatness that was its birthright, doomed to be a monster instead. It wasn't evil. It didn't deserve to be put down, brutally murdered by a poacher who had stormed into its domain. But since when did any of us get what we deserved? So the savage let out a battle cry of his own, then charged the monster head on, swinging his cudgel with determined precision. Maul wasn't crazy. He knew he didn't possess the strength to fell or even slow the beast with a blow to the head, but if he could just take out one of those galloping legs. The cudgel hit the mark, connecting with that thunderous, bony leg, but its effect was less than Maul had expected. Instead of shattering, or at the very least cracking, the leg held, sending wild vibrations up the cudgel and into Maul's arm. It was all he could do to hang on to his weapon in slack-jawed awe as the very leg he struck struck him in return. It was a glancing blow, but still the only thing that saved Maul was the elk leather armor he wore strapped to his body. It was enough to knock him to the ground, however, where he suddenly found himself surrounded by the stampeding, trampling hooves of that great, awesome, terrible monster. He rolled and took cover, scrambling to escape from the tireless pounding of those hooves that in their missed blows shook the very ground that Maul writhed upon. It only lasted for a few short seconds, but a few more and Maul would have been lost. His body stomped into dust and ground into the dirt. It was then Skog returned. She dove upon the monster from some point high above, barreling into the much larger beast with a frightful impact. Though Skog was considerably outweighed, that initial force was enough to knock the monster off Maul and send it and Skog crashing into the snow, where they rolled, fought, bit, and scratched, each letting out a fearsome cry. They were not wars that Maul heard, but were instead howls of agony, the miserable acknowledgement that even the victor of this battle would lose, as it would put down one such as themselves, a noble beast cast from a mold, long broken. Maul pulled himself to his feet as quickly as he could, watching as the much larger monster began to get the better of his companion. He shrugged off the pain in his body and ran, leaping upon the monster's back, and as he did so, he felt it again. That kinship. The knowledge that in a different life, in in a better world, he wouldn't be clambering on the monster's back with malicious intent, but would instead be riding that magnificent creature, leading the horde into battle, surrounded by glittering steam, with Skog galloping alongside them. But that world was well and truly lost, if it ever even existed. And now Maul had only the imperfect reality of the present, the only thing any of us ever have. And now. Maul wrapped his shaking hands around the horn, grasping tightly so as not to be thrown by the monster's frantic thrashing. He hesitated for but a moment as memories flooded his mind, flashing behind his pupils, casting out anything but. He saw his golden statue, the smile turning into a laugh. He saw his blood-stained hands. He heard their cries, their pleas for mercy. He saw the hungry fires and the seas of ashes, and he heard nothing but screams. Let out a scream of his own, flexed his mighty muscles and pulled, ripping that twisted alabaster horn out from the root. Where once there was a terrifying force of nature, now there was only a scared, 
panicked horse. It appeared smaller, cold, fragile, and afraid as it rolled off Skog, letting out a pitiful whine that struck Maul harder than that alabaster horn ever could have. The horse laid on the ground, spasming in agony, watching its sparkling lifeblood steadily seep out and stain the snow beneath it. It looked up, its big eyes filling with tears as they lost their inimitable luster, pleading for mercy from the scowling monster that stood above it, clutching its pride, its glory, in his shaking hand. Maul saw that this majestic creature, the last of its kind, like unto a god upon the earth, a gift unto the earth itself, it was little more than a shell of what it once was, what it should be. As Skog looked on, licking her wounds nonchalantly, Maul fought and struggled, for he saw himself in the monster, now even more than before, and his heart shattered for this dismal, damned creature whom the universe had passed uncaringly by. Maul looked down upon the sad, dying horse, one more casualty in a growing list, one more bit of collateral damage comprised of those who would stand in his way. The beast deserved better, deserved far more than Maul could give it, but, but now Maul could give it but one thing. He knelt down beside the wretched creature slowly, and he did what he always did. He did what he must. Ferris waited nervously, warming themselves by a crackling fire, huddling together for warmth and out of fear for the blood-curdling screams, howls, and cries that echoed out of the frozen north. With the fire beginning to wane and the dual suns beginning to fall behind the trees, Foran turned to the human girl who had insisted on accompanying the party. Bethana, we could be here for some time more, and we'll need to build the fire back up. Fetch us some wood, the driest you can find. Fetch you? Rathana spat. What am I? Your dog? What did I tell you, girl? Maul staggered out from the forest, accompanied by Skog, and clutching that twisted alabaster horn, still dripping in gore. It's done. The monster's dead. Foreign. The Farron leaders and the shamans leapt up from their places at the fire, forgetting the cold, forgetting their fear, forgetting everything but their insatiable lust for that which Maul held tightly in his shaking hand. Foran, as ever, took the lead. I knew that you could do it, my king. It's, it's, it's magnificent. You are magnificent. Maul eyed the Ferris warily as they encircled him, drawn like moths to the gleaming white of the monster's horn. Their eagerness, their avarice, their desire and sadism clear on their faces as those smiles of joy pulled up at the sides back into horrifying rictus grins that were all too familiar to Maul. Give us the horn, my king. Give it to us so that we might give you that which you crave. Allow us to send you to your home realm or, or anywhere else you wish. You deserve it. His hands still shaking, but his stare unbroken, boring holes into the Farron chieftain, Maul stood defiantly. That's all fine and good, and I will take what is owed to me, as I always do. But I also want something else. Maul turned and pointed at the human girl, Grithana. I want my sister. If you're digging Scald, please give it a good review on iTunes, Stitcher, or preferably both. Reviews help to get the show seen and heard by more people, which means that more folks get to experience the aural joy that you just thrilled to. Consider it your good deed for the day. Scald is made available completely free of charge, but if you want to help me pay for hosting costs, the best way to do it is through Patreon, where you can pledge as little as a dollar a month to help the show. For more information, head to patreon.com slash scald. It's just a buck. Come find me on social media. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, they're all just Aubrey Citizen. No spaces, no numbers. 
Or you can head over to my website, aubreycitizen.com, for links to everything, including social media, my non scald related projects, t-shirts, credits, bio, and contact information. Finally, if you're enjoying Scald, please tell your friends, family, even your enemies. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.